gentlemen, and welcome to this new edition of the Middle East Monitor. Well, we will also be talking about the war in the Middle East tonight, unfortunately. And uh, to help us shed some light and bring some insight to these problems, we have invited three very opinionated gentlemen from the city of San Antonio. To uh, my left is Dr. Morris Lampert. Welcome to the show, Dr. Lampert. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Najah Shelji and Dr. Larry Hufford. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Thank you. There is a lot of things about this war that the average American people, your average John Doe out in the street, doesn't really understand. Uh, we've been told so many things. We've been trying to justify why we're into this war. And uh, apparently it seems that everybody's trying to justify somehow or another our presence in the Middle East. and. Uh, Maybe one of you can really tell us why are we there? We heard like we were there for democracy, we're there for oil, we're there for economic reasons, or maybe we're there for the new world order. Uh, can any one of you offer any ideas? Or? I'd be glad to start. Uh, the one reason I, that you mentioned I have not heard is democracy. I mean, mm -hmm. President Bush gave us seven reasons for being involved in the Middle East uh, from defending Saudi Arabia, to liberating Kuwait, to destroying Iraqi military, to the to oil and jobs, and then the nuclear issue, and then this thing called New World Order, which is mm -hmm. pretty undefined. Uh, even former President Richard Nixon wrote an article uh, that was syndicated across the country, and he said, what the American people have to understand is, th is that this issue is not about freedom or democracy. So uh, I think that poses grave questions for me as an American, for a citizen of the United States, and for all of us who are citizens of the United States, because I think if you say there are principles worth dying for, they ought to be freedom, democracy, uh, real threats to our national interest and national security. Mm -hmm. And I think none of those are in operation in the Middle East. So I'd have to conclude mm -hmm. that this is an unjust war. Oh, okay. So you see it as an unjust war. Dr. Shelzy, do you Yes, I really uh, agree with uh, my friend uh, to a great uh, part. But I think it could be approached two ways. Either you see what uh, the administration have listed as a reasons for intervention, or you could just uh, put your own conclusion. The war is already in its fourth week. Uh, we are almost about a month, and you could measure and see what is happening there, and then you could build up your case of why we are there, really. Uh, some of the issue that were stated early on is basically to defend Saudi Arabia, then have the way in, in November that was the policy was shifted and, and twisted, and then it was more an aggressive policy toward uh, dislodging uh, the Iraqi troops from Kuwait. Uh, but behind these, f this frame, actually there was a major, major res reason, and I think oh, I could think right now of two major ones. One is Iraq being viewed as an independent uh, country by itself uh, that is uh, getting uh, in the ascending uh, side. It's uh, trying to build its economy. It's uh, acquiring its own military strength and, and being a little bit more dependent on itself compared to the rest of the Arab countries, that by itself considered uh, as a threat to the security of the region. And I underline the security there. Uh, it meant to be the security of Israel, because during Iran-Iraq war for eight years, nobody was interested about the security. As a matter of fact, most of the officials have said it is specifically that let the war go on and continue until the two sides kill each other and they are completely devastated and destroyed. Uh, when the issue comes to the state of Israel, then there was a security there, and there was a threat to that security. That's one major reason. So the mean to ensure that security was to destroy the Iraqi uh, military machine and the Iraqi infrastructure. The second uh, reason was certainly about to control the resources from that uh, part of the world, and it's been stated very clearly. Although it is not really understood by some people that the U.S. import about 5 to 10 percent of oil from that region. Right. But not to forget that the oil in that region is explored, is taken out from it underground, and then uh, processed, and then shipped, and then sold to the market, to the rest of the world, by U.S., mainly U.S. Uh, oil companies. 
and those U.S. oil companies are major uh, companies. Financially, they are very, very strong, if not the most strong uh, financial strong. power really in, in the whole world. And they certainly exert a major influence on the decision-making people in the U.S. Uh, so they viewed that movement as probably a threat to their interest. And otherwise, uh, from every side, they have stated that the Arab in that region would not be really interested in keeping the oil for themselves. They need the cash. They will be willing to sell the oil under a certain price that will be justified to both sides, the consumer and the, the producer. Mm -hmm. So I think just for the time being, I could think of these two major yeah. reasons well, these, as underlying. Th these one. are very strong points that you have brought up. But then nobody else spoke of you know, the magnitude that you're talking of. I mean, nobody else came out and said, hey, we're there for this or for that. At least from my but perspective, if you follow the news, so the, yeah. uh, you could build up your case in, in through that regard. And then you see what's happening in terms of devastation to that country, to the complete destruction of its infrastructure. Uh, you could uh, be sure that's what happened. And I just could quote uh, Ramsey Clark, who was there for five or six days, right. and he saw the devastation. He saw the number of hostels that being completely destroyed, mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, every uh, type of uh, service in terms of water supply, electrical power, and uh, oil, and other uh, refineries, and, and uh, roads, and bridges, mm -hmm. everything the people need for their daily the life is completely destroyed. Right. And not to, just to say, today uh, we learned about the the complete destruction and devastation of one of the air shelter, probably at least 400 innocent children and, and uh, women and, and elderly being killed. Mm -hmm. uh, that's again another light to show that you know the right. main aim of the war so mm -hmm. far, a city of five million being devastated by somewhere about 70,000 sorties. That never happened in the history of the world. Well, Dr. Lampert, do you uh, agree with what Dr. Najah just said? Do you think that the White House is trying to keep something away from the public? I'm not sure if they even know what they're keeping away. I, I feel that when we talk about motives uh, or uh, frames of reference of a government, whether it's Iraq or whether it's our government, uh, there are obviously many factors, and there's uh, many times uh, administrative uh, actions uh, political actions deal with certain ongoing myths right. that each culture has. And, uh, and I think that we all get caught up with it, and many times we never really know what the motives are until maybe years later. Okay. And, and, I, and I think, I'm not sure if, if the, it's productive to, to speculate on what the motives are, and especially if when you have uh, the effects of a war on population, and it's unfortunately, and it's horrible, that, that doesn't necessarily point to what motives are. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have to be careful about cause and effect. But, but is it the right of the administration to get us all into this mess? It's, after all, our money, our women, our fathers, our sons that are fighting well, the war Well, first of all, I'm, I'm against I war mean, is, is, it, a, is a major yeah. uh, but what, thesis. What, what, but my point is, do you feel that the administration is really has other motives than what they stated? I don't know. Okay. I, I'd, I'd have to say that what what are they appeared to, what do they appear to be acting upon? I see. Number one, the uh, appearance of Iraq going into Kuwait that they have a military machine that right. would make the Middle East unstable, mm -hmm. and then with the future use of uh, nuclear weapons would be a major threat. I'm not sure if oil is a factor. I'm not I'm not sure if Kuwait. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm pretty sure Kuwait per se is not a factor. I but see. these others are as one perceives it, mm -hmm. and and that uh, we all. All of us uh, mm -hmm. are um, have what we call rational thinking. Right. Uh, there's no man is inherently rational. There's no such thing as a rational man, mm -hmm. uh, as far as the brain is concerned. Yeah, I would like but, to get to that uh, right, later but, on. But when we start talking about logic, which is learned, we have to be careful about cause and effect, because many times we assume something because our frame of reference mm -hmm. perhaps may be different, and we project that cause uh, as we perceive it. And it may be so. What's what's President Bush's I'm not sure. motives I don't, for I don't going think, into this war? Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, not uh, looking uh, for a conspiracy. I, I don't think there's a single factor that can be viewed as the reason why we really went to war. I think it's more complicated than that. It's the most complicated region of the world, and I think there are many factors involved. Uh, I think there are some factors in terms of the the economic boycott. The studies show that economic boycotts, the 40 that have worked since World War I, mm -hmm. uh, 
the average time it took them to work be effective was two years. Now, we didn't wait that long. One of the reasons we didn't wait that long is because we are the world's largest debtor nation. This is the first time we've ever gone to war as a debtor nation. But $70, $70 million a day to run an economic boycott was getting pretty expensive when we've got all the problems we've got at home. Would people really go for that? Uh, plus, we bought a UN resolution. And how long can you hold together a resolution uh, and, a, and a coalition that's not really together on principle but you gave the Soviet Union $7 billion in economic aid for its support. You removed $6.7 billion of, of uh, debt from, from that Egypt owed the United States. Uh, you removed some of the economic sanctions on China for its abstention at a key point in time. Uh, we literally bought ourselves a UN resolution. Exactly. Uh, so if you can't hold the coalition together, if it's too expensive, mm -hmm. and if you have this, this, these myths and we have a myth about technology. Mm -hmm. And we believe our technology and that we can win a war in a week right. with that technology. That's what Ben said, as a matter Which of fact. means we don't understand the Arab world. We don't understand the Middle East. Mm -hmm. uh, and we don't understand technology. Yeah. Let me, let me go to another point, if you all don't mind. <clears throat> there is also a lot of myths that we've been hearing in, about uh, the uh, psyche or the personality of Saddam Hussein. I mean, I have never heard of a, a, a human being being so <laughs> insulted and so, uh, you know, just like the way Saddam Hussein has been insulted. And, you know, and uh, a lot of people are coming out, the so-called uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, experts, and this and that, and everybody's trying to call him something or another. Uh, does any, uh, you're a neurologist, Dr. Lampert, what do you think? I mean, are we being really objective, or is it some type of a propaganda that we're trying to sell our people in order for us to settle for the war and really make everybody hate this man and justify our actions? What do you think? Well, of course, you had several questions. Let's take one at a time. Okay. <clears throat> Certainly, historically, mm -hmm. uh, we know that uh, Saddam Hussein uh, has uh, been involved in violence uh, mm -hmm. by, the, by the nature of the circumstances right. and is certainly anything but a nice guy. Mm -hmm. um, now the question is, is can one accurately, a psychiatrist accurately uh, uh, determine what type of person? Of course not. I mean, unless you, one has direct access to a person, you can't mm -hmm. really determine what kind of personality he is. You can only right. go by. <coughs> and, and I think what they've done is right. primarily go by behavior. Mm -hmm. um, now the other portion of it is I think that in any type of confrontation, uh, and it's not just now, you can go back hundreds of years, you can go thousands of years mm -hmm. for that matter, it's always appropriate to paint the other side as dismally black as you can. And, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm not trying to make a pun on color, but, no. uh, and, and this has always been the case. Now sometimes those labels and the, that type of information may mm -hmm. be valid sometimes it may not be. We, and many times you may right. not know until well, years well, later. So, mm -hmm. uh, so I think that when we're talking about his behavior, number one, the, the historical evidence is mm -hmm. that, that there has been a great deal of violence and murder. Number two, how sensitive is he? I mean, his personality uh, uh, points. No one really knows. And you can't project that from a distance. No, no anal an, uh, analyst can. So you don't buy the analysis that's being sold to us over the TV well, well, not, networks well, and well, things like that? Well, I'm not sure specifically about what okay. you're referring to, but because uh, I haven't heard, I really haven't been Well, I've that. heard that he, uh, has, he's been described as a Hitler. He's been described as killing this, as killing that. He's a man that'll never do this, that'll never do that. I, I mean, it's really too much. And, and just oh. yesterday, I think I was reading in the Time magazine, uh, they we're trying to paint him just the fact that he is being an Arab, uh, he is, um, I even forgot the term that they used, uh, like uh, something is wrong with his psyche just because him being an Arab and being raised and well, born of in course, that part now, that of the world. Is absolutely and, wrong, and that was and really yeah. an attack on my own values. Right, because right, of course, <laughs> but, but this, is, oh, this is a different question and an important one mm -hmm. because I think you can't talk about one person project to people. I okay. mean, this, is, this has been... Right. This Let's is to go to Dr. Shelgi, uh, maybe. I, I really want to just 
mention two points. This is mm -hmm. a big question at three to quality yeah, of time. We, we, one thing is that whenever you compare or you talk about one statement or one state as such or a country, you cannot take it in isolation from the rest of the surrounding. You have to study its history. You have to study what happened in terms of event to bring up certain regimes and certain people to certain positions and, and hold on uh, the major office of, of power in that region. So you cannot isolate one president or king in that region from the rest. So you have to compare him, for example, with uh, King Fahed and mm -hmm. what he have done. According to the Amnesty International, King Fahed gave the order to dislodge one million Yemenis working, working in, in Saudi. Mm -hmm. In a three-month period, you have a refugee of Yemenis. Right. Uh, one million of them. Mm -hmm. You have to compare it, for example, to yeah. Turkey. The well, Turkish I, I agree with you, but we're talking oh, about Saddam Hussein. Uh, yes, yeah, but what I'm saying, yeah. trying to see, you have to have a fair yeah. judgment. You have to compare In order to, to come to a conclusion, you have things, to have some comparison. Yes. Right. The second thing, we as a civilized nation, as a people with, you know, with, with studies, with so many people uh, in universities and, and mm -hmm. investigating the things, we have to be also watching ourselves to make sure that we pass a fair judgment, irrespective of the time, especially war or preparation for, for war is a very stressful time uh, on, on all the nation, on right. everybody. So to make a fair assessment, I will just make one example. There was a big uh, uh, talk about the rape and the killing in Kuwait, mm -hmm. and there was one major example, everybody referred to it, even President Bush in one of the speeches, Amnesty International had talked about it, about an incident of three 312 children being taken out of their uh, 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 baby incubators, thrown in the hostels on the floor, let to die, and they, the Iraqi soldiers stole those incubators and took them to Baghdad. If you just read an article written in Nation, one of the investigators who investigated this event was a Saudi himself. He went after the doctor who described an event where 72 he have witnessed, mm -hmm. and he went to see the girl, the 15 yeah. years old that came as a witness. Yeah. She Dr. Shelby, I'm sorry, I think we're getting out of this. Well, see, uh, what I'm trying to, to talk about is these all these so-called psychoanalysts uh, yeah, exactly. that are painting Saddam Because Hussein I'm coming to this point, point if you just passion. give me one more okay. second. If you examine this, not a single case was proven that there was a baby thrown out of the incubator. Okay. Not a single baby was killed because of that. There were two incidents of babies killed because of the sanction of some medicine, probably antibiotic was not available. Mm -hmm. And you could imagine how this picture drawn all over the country, uh, all the news media used it. Mm -hmm. Nobody asked if it is really truly or not. And you could just project this story to many other stories mm -hmm. that we fabricated just to do one thing, to prepare the stage to dehumanize certain people and, and certain nation. So when we attack them, we as people living here feel justified. Well, yeah. I, th I think the talk is about Saddam Hussein yeah. in person. Yeah. I never heard of anybody, you know, saying that you know, the Iraqis are bad or this but or let that. Let me answer it's, that. Uh, yeah, please. The, the Saddam Hussein. Let me argue yeah. that Saddam Hussein is an evil person. Okay. All right. The world's full of evil people. Mm -hmm. uh, Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge would be classic examples. And I would argue that Pol Pot would come far closer to being Hitler than Saddam Hussein. <laughs> Killed well over a million of his own people in a ruthless, brutal manner. And we're, we, we have spent the last several years trying to bring him back into power, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. We're very selective. Uh, and there's a double standard that, we, that the third world, and I think the Arab world, understands very clearly. And the American people don't understand mm -hmm. how we're viewed by other uh, peoples. Okay. Uh, but I would argue that, sure, Saddam Hussein has done some horrendous things. Mm -hmm. So has Assad. So once we finish with, uh, with Saddam Hussein, do we go after Assad? I would argue that Richard Nixon did some horrendous things. Exactly. Including trying Johnson. to subvert the Constitution yeah. of the United States. Mm -hmm. I would say that when we, when a nation that drops 15,000 pound bombs on a people are doing evil things. Right. I think we have to broaden this definition Or when definition we bombed Hanoi, I mean, could we legitimately say that President uh, Johnson was not uh, stable or something like that when he ordered the bombing of Hanoi? We literally went to wipe Hanoi out. But anyway, let's, let's go on a little bit. Um, well, before we leave that, uh -huh. <coughs> but, I, but I think the difference is, is that here you have a man who potentially could have nuclear weapon in his hand, mm -hmm. who's <coughs> viewed by the standards perhaps maybe uh, unstable. I mean, uh, as 
as perceived from this end of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's far more dangerous than having someone in Hanoi well, who doesn't Israel have Israel had already more than 200 nuclear head. Mm -hmm. Should we go after it? Uh, North or South Korea, they are already in the progress and, and, and they you are know, about another to. Thing, another thing, Shamir we has also a history thousands. of... Uh, we are the biggest nation on Earth that has a nuclear head. Now we are posing a thousand nuclear head in the Gulf against a small, tiny country called Iran. So well, I, would, uh, uh, I would argue, uh, since since we're into psychoanalysis, yes. you know, I, I would argue that we are the only nation in the history of the world to use nuclear weapons, and we're the good guys. Mm -hmm. Now, if we can't trust ourselves, we certainly can't trust anyone else with I them. See. I think that's the problem. We don't trust ourselves. We talk seriously about using them in Vietnam. We talk seriously about using them in the Eisenhower administration over two little islands called Quimor and Matsu. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're talking about using tactical nuclear weapons now, and we're the good guys. So obviously we can't trust the bad guys. Okay. But Pakistan has the bomb, India has the bomb, China has the bomb. Uh, so why do we selectively say all of a sudden, this no to be. Iraq? Okay, okay. Let me, this is very important. <clears throat> do y'all think that, are we really operating within the, or in accordance to the uh, United Nations Security Council uh, uh, resolution 678. I Does don't think. It, it doesn't okay. seem, again, uh, first of all, it did not really uh, condition that uh, force has to be used. It gave it as a as a last resort type of thing. The other things you could but do, But they gave an the ultimatum, fact. Dr. Shelby. Yeah, I look at the fact. It stated June 15th. Look right. at the fact. Who's leading the force and the power uh, uh, of war today? Is it the end of the United Nation? Do the United Nation has any way of monitoring what's going on? Well, see, that's Who my question. The war? That's my Who question. Who is conducting the war? Uh, are we operating in accordance? I don't think. See, because apparently in... I in, don't think. Okay. In uh, the resolution itself, it states the liberation of Kuwait. It, uh, nowhere in the resolution it, it says to de destroy Iraq or the military apparatus of Iraq. Uh, Dr. Uh, Hufford? No, I, one, of the one of the other reasons I consider this an unjust war is because of proportionality. Mm -hmm. That's one of the principles of just war. And then also that it has to be fought uh, in, a, in a manner that will lead to a just peace. And so there are three reasons why I don't believe it's a just war. But proportionality, no. I, I don't think we were given the mandate to destroy Iraq. But I think the motive never was to simply liberate Kuwait, I think it was just to destroy the Iraqi military yeah. and destroy Saddam Hussein. I see. Um, Dr. Shalji, may I please have the, I need to quote you something that I read sure. yesterday. This is uh, USA Today, and uh, here it says the United Nations is irked because uh, Iraq apparently has published uh, some of the talks that took place between Saddam Hussein and uh, Perez de Cuellar. And uh, it states here, the transcript is taken out of context. United Nations officials say, the translation, uh, okay. This is the one this where... This is what Perez de Cuellar stated, that uh, like what America wants today is what happens and not what the Security Council wants. Perez de Cuellar is said to have replied, I agree with you as far as the issues that concern me. And he was said to have praised Saddam for championing the Palestinian issue. And on the Palestinian issue itself, he, I quote... Uh, this is Perez de Cuellar. I do not want to argue with your excellency. This achievement on the Palestinian problem has come through your efforts. So is he trying to say, I mean, how do you read this? How would you take this? I read that as we paid our $187 million debt to the United Nations as soon as these resolutions went through. I see, I see. Uh, Dr. Lampert? In, in terms of that article? Yes. I mean, are we really operating in accordance to the uh, UN resolution? Well, I think in terms of the, the wording of it, I, I think we are. In terms of the uh, mechanism by which any military wants to protect their soldiers, and this is different, you're a different frame of reference now. Okay. And, and I think then it's, it's up to the military to make the decisions that protects and keeps the lives down, not in terms of the lives of the Iraqi boys. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really obviously not a concern. In a way, it is. I mean, if they can avoid a land war, then it's better for both sides. Okay. But I think that in terms of the um, so military... So you, think, think, you well, think our actions are really justified to bomb Iraq? To well, well, I think that in terms of strictly military motives mm -hmm. and, and trying to protect and keep the number of lives down, American lives, I think that the, the approach has been to try to completely disrupt 
uh, military infrastructure uh, between Kuwait and Iraq. Okay. Um, and I think from that point of view, it could be viewed, and it obviously is viewed within guidelines. Now the question is, is what constitutes overkill? Right. And, uh, well, so do you feel so we're exceeding the mandate of the United Nations? I, I can't answer that. I don't. Okay. I, I think it's within the wording of the United Nations because the United Nations doesn't give directions on how you go about doing this, mm -hmm. and that's really up to the military. Okay. Let me, let me go a little bit further, and let's talk about President Bush himself. Did he really have any alternatives other than war? I mean, could we have avoided this war? Oh, certainly it could have been avoided. I don't know any war that's been fought in history that could not have been avoided, avoided including World War II. The roots of that are found in the, the unjust peace of World War I. So war is, is made by humankind, and it can be avoided. Uh, so certainly he could. I think there are some reasons why he did not, and I think there are some reasons why the Democrats showed that they didn't have a lot of spine and standing up and opposing him. Uh, one, once he committed troops to the Middle East, and the number that he committed them, he painted himself into a corner. You either use them or you bring them home. If you bring them home without having used them, and Kuwait is still part of Iraq and, and Saddam Hussein is still in power, mm -hmm. you might as well not announce for re-election because you've lost the presidency. Uh, politically, you've lost. I mean, he already had the wimp image he was trying to overcome. Uh, if you use the troops, you have to win a quick military victory, as in Panama and Grenada, and that will make your popularity so great that the Democrats don't have a chance. So you, you're trying to say that we could have avoided this war? Certainly. We had now a chance to. Now we're bogged down in a longer war, okay. which I think is going to mean that, that, that there are some real problems for George Bush's re-election. See, before, I'm sorry we don't have too much time left, but before we leave this show, I would like to talk a little bit about Israel and its implications within the realm of this war itself. Does any one of you has a view? Why, why is Iraq really attacking Israel? What are because the implications it has, there? It has a, a belief that it is being attacked on a basic principle that it is the only Arab country that could withstand the threat of the Israelis. Okay. That's the basic reason, that it's believed so. And it seems like the leadership over there convinced that's the case. So that's why they, 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 uh, they do what Israel. they are doing. But, uh, Dr. Hufford? Well, I, I think the United States action is doing two things. It's, it's undermining the uh, moderate uh, mo Islamic population, the Sunni population. And I think we're seeing a, a going to see, because of the American presence, a widespread growth of Islamic fundamentalism. I think we're going to see, and we've already seen with General Zev coming into the cabinet mm -hmm. in Israel, a strengthening of the right political position, uh, meaning right-wing mm -hmm. political position in Israel a hardening of the lines, making a post-war negotiated settlement mm -hmm. more difficult. I see. Dr. Lampert, uh, like the, the mm -hmm. average man in the street does not understand why is Iraq attacking Israel. Do you, can you shed some light on that? Well, like why? My, my impression is that, that it's strictly to try to force Israel into the fight so that it would uh, sort of muddy the waters. I think, uh, and they may succeed in that. I, I really don't, uh, Israel was an issue initially. Mm -hmm. I think that the, uh, however, uh, and, uh, and I think this is, uh, I think there's a way out. I think that, that there's really more chance for a negotiated settlement now. I'm sorry, Dr. Thought. Lampert, we're practically out of time. I uh, want to thank you gentlemen for being with us tonight. And ladies sure, and gentlemen, thank you. thank you for watching. And please join us next week when we're going to discuss the post-war Gulf. And thank you very much. Peace on Earth. Please, in the middle of the night, I'll be leaving.